speaking on behalf of um, 13 different agencies that are working together, most specifically the three resettlement agencies in Cleveland. Um, there's International Services, Us Together, then Catholic Charities, and we work so hard to make these communities welcoming, to introduce refugees to their new neighborhoods. And this is a huge event. I'm just shocked how many people are here. So thank you for taking the time to come. I'm going to give you just an overview of the refugee process as it applies to all three resettlement agencies in Cleveland. Um, so who are refugees? Refugees. Refugees are people that are forced out of their homeland due to a well-founded fear of persecution. And it's usually at the hands of other people who want to persecute them, or hurt them, or imprison them. As soon as that person crosses an international border, they become a refugee. So they have to leave their homeland, and they have to be in a second country. Um, some of the stories that you know that I'll share with you, it's the, the reasons as to why, is because they didn't have the same religion as the majority of that country. Maybe they didn't have the same political view of that majority of that country. So those are all factors as to why they were pushed out of that home country. So in Cleveland, this is pretty much where the refugees are coming from, and pretty much nationally. Uh, on the left-hand side, side, you'll see Iraq, and Congo, Bhutan. Many of these countries you might not even be familiar with. Um, the Kingdom of Bhutan, a very small Asian country. Eritrea, um, a small country that's kind of new. I think it formed in 1991. This is where the 300, I'm sorry, the 650 to 700 refugees that come to the Cleveland each year, these are the countries that they're coming from. Worldwide, there's about 10 million refugees. Um, out of that, those, out of those 10 million, and I know this is very loud. I have three. <laughs> I know this is very loud. So I'm trying to lower my voice. I have three boys at home, and I'm always yelling at them, so I don't even know if I need this. But, um, so worldwide, there's 10 million refugees. And the UN actually has three durable solutions for those refugees in the second country. The first solution is that they can safely return home. And many refugees would like to do that. They would like to return home. But they can't, because the same people Thomas that pushes them out is there to welcome them back. The second durable solution is that they stay in that second country, that that second country will offer them all the rights and privileges of anybody else from that second country. That doesn't happen. Usually that host country looks at refugees as, a, as a, maybe a burden on their economic system, um, competition for employment, so they're not always welcome. So the third durable solution is a third country resettlement. So the United States and about 23 other countries resettle for refugees in a third country. Canada, Ireland, Brazil, all do it. The United States actually welcomes the vast majority. Um, about 65,000 refugees a year will come to the U.S. through a resettlement office. So, Eritrea, um, an example of somebody that we just resettled in August is a, is a woman that came from this country of Eritrea. It's been compared to as the North, North Korea of Africa. And when she was seven, um, she contracted measles and she became blind, um, permanently blind. And that didn't stop again. She worked at that. She became a teacher in that country. And um, because Ethiopia and Eritrea was in a long civil war, there was a lot of soldiers being injured a lot of um, benefits were going to these folks that were injured. So her and about 50 other disabled folks decided that that wasn't always equitable and fair to them. So they put together a petition to challenge the government to give her and other folks with disabilities equal rights that anybody else would have. And she was one of the lucky five that actually got to take that petition to the government and give it to them. And challenge the government to make some changes in the way that they treat folks with disability. And not only was she disabled, she also was a minority religion. She was Baha'i. So that, by her doing that, by her having the courage to stand up and put herself out there, subjected her to persecution. She quickly lost her job as a teacher. And she started getting phone calls from people. You know, do you want to recant that petition? Why don't you reconsider your position on this? You know, you really should do this. That would be the best thing for you. And she said no. Then they offered her, hey, you can join our political party. She said no. So at this point, somebody called her and said, you've got to leave. You know, that's the only thing you can do. So she had to make a decision. Where is she going to go to? She could have went to Ethiopia and knew that 
crossing the border, she might get killed. She could have went to Sudan. She told me she, could, she wanted to go to Khartoum, um, but that wasn't an option either. So she had to get somebody that actually ferry her all the way from Eritrea to Uganda, which is about a thousand miles away. And that's where she lived for five years before she came to Cleveland in August. And one more example. Um, this is this mile. This mile actually is from Afghanistan. Um, and he's a special immigrant visa holder, so he's a refugee too. He worked as an interpreter for five years with the U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Um, he was actually in the Karangal Valley. If, uh, the Karangal Valley is in the northeastern part of Afghanistan. And in the first five years of the war in Afghanistan, 80% of all the ordnance were dropped in the Karangal Valley. So he served the troops. He interpreted for them. Um, and eventually, the, the, the insurgents caught on to who he was and who his actual identity was. So then there was actually threats against him. There was threats against his family. Um, and through a special program for our government, he was able to come. So we have folks that are coming from Afghanistan and Iraq that, that served our troops very honorably for many years who now have the opportunity because if they stayed back, they might be killed. So that, that is. And I just added a few photos of some of the camps, actually. Um, and I put a couple things in here. The, the picture on the bottom left-hand corner is the Dada. That's in Kenya, and that's one of the largest refugee camps in the world. That's in the northeastern part of Kenya. Um, right above it um, is another refugee camp in Kakuma that I've been to, and actually Karen Wishner was at too. That's the runway from landing from Lebanon. And then I added a couple other pictures of, because not all refugees are coming from refugee camps. Some are urban refugees, some live in the cities, some work in the cities. You're going to hear from Louise in a little bit, but that's the hospital that she worked at in Zambia before she came here. Um, so refugees come from camps, and some don't come from camps. Some are hidden in the streets, hiding just by time before they get resettled. So th this is the, 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 the basic process: is that there's 10 million refugees in the world. Um, each year, then the United Nations refers a group of refugees to the United States to, to resettle here. Um, and it's through the State Department. So the refugees are then screened, they have background checks, medical checks, and once they're approved for resettlement, um, that they can actually come to the United States, then the State Department will work with 10 entities, 10 national organizations, voluntary organizations in Washington that have affiliate offices in Cleveland. So Catholic Charities, International Services, and Us Together is three of the resettlement agencies that has a national office. They will then allocate the approved refugees to Cleveland, and they'll make decisions based on the fact that they have family members here, if we have the language capability, and other things like that. And then, once they're approved, then they wait again. And that could be a four-month wait, that could be a two-year wait, before they're actually booked on the floor. So why Cleveland? Well, it's not because of the weather, well, really, it's not a joke, but it's not because of the weather, obviously. It's not because Brian Sykes is still playing, or Michael Stanley, that, you know, um, as you knew some, or LeBron, actually. A lot of refugees are kind of excited to be back in Cleveland now that LeBron's back. Cleveland's actually pretty affordable. It, they're safe and affordable housing. They're strong schools, strong communities. Um, our long tradition of having immigrants come to the community um, gives us a lot of opportunity to use them as as mentors, um, use them as resources for interpreting. So it has a long history of, of welcoming refugees. And actually, the three resettlement offices have close to 100 years of work just in the field of refugee resettlement. So we're not even, this isn't new. Um, this is the initial part of that we do. Um, and usually this happens in the very first month to six months that refugees are here. But all the resettlement offices equally look for houses. They live in the west side of Cleveland, they live in the east side of Cleveland, Lakewood. We enroll the children in school. We connect them to the health care providers who can give them another medical check. And we do that very quickly and it's very fast paced work. Um, and that's just the initial piece. So then, beyond that, I think there's a misunderstanding out there that I hear a lot that the resettlement offices only work with refugees for six months, and that's just not true. Um, all of us work with folks, with refugees, for five years, up to five years, in different intensities and different services. The five-year mark is typically when 
a refugee is finally able to become a U.S. citizen, and most do. Um, so during that five years, we're, we, the resettlement offices, are working with our partner agencies to help them retain their job, find another job, um, helping triage problems, helping them fit into the community. So things that we do, um, at the charities and, and us together and international services, we do things with the metro parks, like youth outdoors, where we take groups of kids out for hiking, and kayaking, and all kinds of rock climbing. It's, it's a lot of fun. We get kids rolled on soccer teams. Um, just some more, these are some of our partner agencies. We have pictures of neighborhood family practice, the refugee response. Again, just it's the long-term process of really trying to help them fit in. And then lastly, our goal, and everybody's goal, is to become a U.S. citizen, which most refugees do. Um, and like I said earlier, that, you know, becoming naturalizing is a big decision. And I've met so many refugees that tell me that this is the first time in their life that they've ever had an opportunity to call any single country their home, their nation. So that's the, uh, that's the basic how they arrive here, how they're processed, and where they land. So 